we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Despite constitutional guarantees, American civil rights and liberties are constantly in danger of violation, whether by individuals, corporations, or government institutions. Regardless of whether personal prejudices or national security's concerns lie at the root of these violations, challenging them and holding wrongdoers accountable is imperative for the sake of the constitutional integrity and the preservation of the American way. Trial lawyers advocate for awareness, the truth, and a person's right to know. They believe that in the absence of the truth, all of us stand helpless to defend ourselves, our families, our health, and our way of life. Oftentimes, we don't think about or worry about or understand what is happening to another until it happens to us. Deceits have no boundaries. Disease doesn't recognize the color of our skin or our political party's affiliation. When it comes to cover-ups and false allegations by agencies of the state and the federal government, there is not a soul amongst us who does not have a cringing fear of their overwhelming awesome power. It is at these times that we need experienced and dedicated trial lawyers, the warriors in the courtroom, who are willing to battle for us tooth and nail in the halls of justice to protect our cherished way of life. Such a call for justice happened on February 10, 1994, when the state of Wyoming Department of Family Services revoked Connie and Roland Nation's daycare center license in Riverton, Wyoming. Based on totally false allegations, unsubstantiated by any evidence whatsoever, they caused the nation's extensive economic losses, the loss of their business, public censure, and a personal embarrassment. Today, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines to investigate how Vance Countryman, the nation's lawyer, proved that the Wyoming Department of Family Services wrongfully and falsely accused the nations of this indignant injustice and received a public apology from the state of Wyoming in addition to a well-deserved, justified financial settlement. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from Lander, Wyoming, at the law firm of Vance Countryman. It's my great pleasure to introduce Vance Countryman to the show. Welcome to the show, Vance. Thank you. We have uh, an interesting case here where the government used its awesome power against a couple that was just doing nothing. And we're, we're going to get into the actual story first. But your practice consists of representing little guys, don't they? Absolutely. Uh, we represent almost exclusively individuals or mom and pop kinds of businesses. What made you decide that that's the kind of career you wanted with your life? I guess because I don't fit in corporate America. I honestly, um, I don't have the right attitude, mentality, setting, whatever you want to call it. But, but what I do have is a great desire to take care of people, to serve people. And uh, so when we interview folks and we find cases where we see that people have been wronged, we do everything in our power to, uh, to help those people right or wrong. In other words, when you see an injustice being Absolutely. done, you want to make it right. And, and let me tell you, justice is hard to find in this country anymore. Yeah. So that's exactly what we do. I want our audience to know that when I say you want to make it right, you not only 
walk the talk, but you put your money where your mouth is, right? It's our money that goes into these cases. And um, uh, frankly, if, if injured people had to finance their own litigation, yeah. they would never see the courthouse steps. They would, they would never even get started. I mean, just to file a suit in federal court, it costs $300. Really? And I, that's not a huge sum of money, but I'll tell you, to somebody who's out of work, uh, they've been injured, they're behind in their rent or their, or their house payment. Uh, I guess because I don't fit in corporate America. I honestly, um, I don't have the right. Do you think judges, when they hear a case, you know, where the defendant, let's say a corporation, and they have conducted themselves in an egregious manner, outrageous conduct, do you think that they are incensed, a judge, incensed by the behavior of the defendant? Those people, right or wrong. I think that's why there's such a push. Absolutely. You you want to make it um, and, and let me tell you, justice is hard to find in this country anymore. So that's exactly what we do. Uh, I, want want I think though, that's the I whole push you want mm -hmm. to behind tort reform and, and behind uh, legislating caps on damages. It's because, our money that goes into these uh, cases. And frankly, if, if injured people right. had to finance are, are their own litigation, Right. They would never um, see the courthouse steps. They, they would, they would the never right even get well. started. So I mean, just to file a suit in federal court, it costs three hundred dollars, and I, that's not a huge sum of money. But I'll tell you, to somebody who's out of work, uh, they've been injured. They're behind. When any medical student attends medical school, they are taught the Hippocratic oath, which is to try to preserve, at all costs if possible, the life, the comfort of a human being when any student is in law school, aren't they all taught that they should seek justice, follow the law, do the right thing? Or isn't everybody told this? I think, honestly, I think they are, and I think that's why there's such a push to legislate um, scenarios where even judges can't hold or jurors can't hold. Uh, corporations accountable. I think that's the whole push behind tort reform and behind uh, legislating caps on damages because, uh, you know, judges are humans too and when they see when there's something that's egregious that's happened and that the injuries are, are, are huge, um, they want to do the right thing as well. And so what, uh, what happens then is that corporate America exerts its influence in Congress or even at the state level to try and rein in their exposure. You know, because every time I think of that, these best lawyers that go to work for corporate law firms, I'm trying to think, do they have a conscience at night? Do they think this was the wrong thing to do to cheat this person out of a, you know, of a just settlement? Well, I think that I sleep better at night. Are they all taught? Mm -hmm. That they and, should uh, seek justice. And I'm glad I do what I do. Follow the law. Do the right Let's talk about the Wyoming Department of Family Services think, and the know, case that we're going to talk about here today, to um, pass, which uh, uh, is a daycare call. center that yeah, was owned and, by uh, Connie and Roland and Nations. Chinese. Tell us about that case. Well, I think the first thing a person needs to understand is the overwhelming power that the Department of Family Services has. Once again, um, the legislature is so concerned that each one of these cases be investigated, and it ought to be investigated, that it creates a carte blanche immunity for anybody who reports these and investigates these. So you could have someone who turns you in for child abuse or child neglect, it being completely malicious, no basis for, right. for the allegation, and yet they have complete immunity. In yeah. fact, you can't even find out the name of the person who reported the incident. I understand in this case, a 12-year-old girl reported an incident. That's what we understand, that a 12-year-old girl who the nations would not allow their daughter, who at the time, I think she was five, maybe she was, she was young, four, five, six, they would not let her go over to this 12-year-old's house and play. And uh, so one day when this, when the nation's daughter was getting off the bus, this 12-year-old called into DFS and said that they had seen um, Mr. Nations knock the five-year-old to the ground, kick her repeatedly, 
and grab her and throw her in the truck and then go home. Wouldn't it seem that an adult receiving this phone call would question the veracity of a child making this accusation? Well, immunity for anybody who reports these and investigates these. So you could have someone who turns you in for child abuse or child neglect, it being completely malicious, no basis for, for the allegation, and yet they have complete immunity. In fact, you can't even find out the name of the person who reported the incident. I understand in this case, a 12-year-old girl reported an incident. That's what we understand, that a 12-year-old girl who the nations would not allow their daughter, who at the time, I think she was five, maybe she was, she was young, four, five, six, they would not let her go over to this 12-year-old's house and play. And uh, so one day when, this, when the nation's daughter was getting off the bus, this 12-year-old called into DFS and said that they had seen um, Mr. Nations knock the five-year-old to the ground, kick her repeatedly, and grab her and throw her in the truck and then go home. Would it seem that an adult receiving this phone call would question the veracity of a child making this accusation? Well, you have to remember, and he, by the way, was how old at this time? wisdom again. They have to investigate okay. every report. They, they don't find too many law. violent grandfathers. So they take the report. <laughs> now, here's where the intelligence factor comes in, in my mind. Yeah. They, they go to the nation's home. This little girl is sitting in a, in a, um, yeah. a high chair, eating, I think it was Cheerios, something like that, and she was watching cartoons. Uh, the nations cooperated so completely. So they come to their house, the DFS and the very came first in. time they tell they him he has to leave. took the little girl into a bedroom. They removed her shirt and her pants. There's no marks, no scuffs, no red marks. There, there's nothing to indicate that that little girl had been exposed to trauma at all. Law enforcement shows up, and under Wyoming law, the only person who can take a While child out of the home is a police officer. Yeah. DFS can't do that. So the, the police officer shows up. He looks at the little girl. He sees what's going on. He leaves. But that's not good enough for the Department of Family Services. They tell Mr. Nations that if he doesn't leave the residence right then, that they're and going to take the little girl level, into custody. level, what position of this and, DFS uh, uh, and separate uh, her from organization her was this person? Just a counselor, an investigator? They have a team called Child Protective Services, and they have people whose sole job is to investigate allegations of right. abuse and neglect. So it isn't like this person's untrained or unskilled. In fact, when you look at how this case carried out, you can see the level of sophistication that was used against mm -hmm. the nations. That there isn't any question in my mind that the DFS workers knew to the precise moment what it was they intended to do and how they intended to treat the nations. So Roland is in a hotel for a week. That's right. They're following all the instructions. What happens then? Well, um, they meet with um, Yvonne Rice, who was the caseworker, and she's the one who made the comment that that they would take the little girl out of the home. And uh, she says, listen, let's just enter an agreement. You do some counseling um, and everything will be fine. Right. So about three days pass, three, four days. The nations go down to the DFS office and uh, meet with Yvonne Rice, where she has an agreement prepared. Standard form. Standard form. This is a, this is a fill in the blank kind yeah. of form. And then at the bottom it has a space where they can uh, set out what each of the terms are because they would vary from case to case. Mm -hmm. The nations both sign that document, slide it back over to Ms. Rice. They don't really read it. Well, I think they scan it, but I don't yeah. think they appreciate the nature of what it is they're signing. Yeah. But from the DFS's position, that is an admission of abuse. By signing that document and agreeing to do those things, they've admitted by, by that document, they've admitted abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, the ramification of that is they can't maintain their daycare license. So, so when did they find this out? Within a breath. Because when they slid the document across the table, right. Yvonne Rice slid over to them a document revoking their daycare license. So she knew what was coming. At she didn't the, tell them. At the onset, when they yeah. walked in the room... 
it was already set that they were going to take the nation's daycare license. And it's important to understand that their daycare license was yeah. their only source Standard of form. income this is a, this for is a, a couple in their mid-70s. Fill in the blank kind of form and then at the bottom. Raising a child that they didn't have to raise, they took this child on because they wanted to give her a better what each life. What the terms are. And now their license is revoked right then and there. Both okay. signed that Very document, they can no longer slide it back uh, over to Ms. Rice. So not only does it dis dis well, I think they scan mm -hmm. it, but I don't think they appreciate that they must have been shocked. They're signing, but from the DFS's position, that is an admission of I mean, abuse by signing that document and agreeing to do those things. They've admitted by by that document they've admitted abuse now the ramification of that is mr nations when he got that letter, they can't maintain their daycare license so listen within a breath because when they slid the document across the table yvonne rice slid over to them a document revoking their daycare license did they take the child at the onset. Well, that's kind of odd. They revoked the license but didn't take the child. Wouldn't the child be more important than the license? Daycare license. Well, it's important uh, from their perspective, that their daycare license I guess they must the only thought, source of income well, for a couple can't do anything about this one, but we're going to raising a child. Raising a child that they didn't have to raise, they took this child off because mm -hmm. they wanted to give her a better. So how did this case come to you? Well, right I received a phone at that very moment, they can no longer um, open their daycare business. So not only does it dis disrupt the nations, it was devastating to the nations. Every family whose child is in that daycare now has no place for daycare. I mean, the nations literally had a list of every person who wrote letters and talked about how... So in other words, the government agency comes in and said, this is the way it's going to be. And there's no appeal. And Mr. No Nations, appeal. when he got that letter, Unless you go to court. When, he, when that was slid well, back to him, he told them, yes, listen, there is a mechanism let me stay out. I'll, I'll stay out of the home. They said, no, no. Mm -hmm. You live in that home. Uh, you've been mine, found to be an abuser. Uh, you can't be in the home and be in and, ha and maintain yeah, a daycare can, upstairs. We no, together, they did not. Kind of Six months they revoked the license but didn't take the child. Wouldn't the child be more important than the license? That's a perfect civil rights case. Well, uh, from their perspective, I, I guess they must have thought, well, they denied him well process. There was no we can't do anything about this one, but we're going to we're gonna save all the, the other, you know, 30, 40 kids, however many kids were in that daycare. So how that kind of agency action well, uh, I received a phone call from Connie, and she was just, um, I wouldn't say hysterical, but, but I mean, she was distraught. And meanwhile, moment, what are they doing? Six I, months later, I, I, my oh, caseload was such I couldn't do anything See, about it. But like they wanted to business. appeal the decision, like and GM. in that particular right. case, you know, there was no mechanism for you to seek a review of the decision by the Department of Family Services. So in other words, they get the government get the agency billion dollar loan. Said, this is the way it's going to be. See, the and there's no appeal. Right. Unless they have the same problems though. Well, when the daycare shuts down, their cash flow stops. Now they can't service their payments on their daycare and, and their foodstuffs that they had for lunch. That gets uh, used up and they don't have mm -hmm. the money to, to refinance it. So by the time that the civil rights case was brought, they're completely shut down. They, they don't have the money to reopen because they've used that money living because there's no cash flow. And Congress isn't coming there to help them. So now you're going to handle this case as a civil rights case. What do you do first? Well, the good thing about civil rights is that we don't have to go through governmental claim procedures. We don't have to give notice and send letters and do all that. We can just pull the trigger and sue them and get going. And that's what we did. Taking on the Wyoming Department of Family Services is like taking on any governmental agency. Well, it is. And, and here's the fun part, because see, they all think they're bulletproof because they have complete immunity. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. Well, the good thing about a civil rights case, uh, sometimes it's referred to as a 1983 action, um, states cannot frustrate that federal purpose. When the daycare shuts down, their cash flow stops. Now they can't service their payments on their daycare and, and their foodstuffs that they had for lunch. So you filed this case in federal court? Um, actually, we filed in state court. The 11th Amendment prevents us from filing suit against the state in federal yeah. court. So. We, uh, we tried this case, or it was uh, going to be tried in front of Judge Rogers.
Now, I have read a, a, a lot of complaints against the Department of Family Services in a lot of different states. Is this a, a common way of filing? Are there a lot of lawsuits filed against the Department of Family Services? Um, honestly, this is the only case I know of that uh, was brought this way until about a year and a half ago. I met a lawyer out of Oregon, and he does a great deal of litigation against their state Department of Family Services or yeah. their equivalent um, under this kind of an act. The, the truth is, this is the only mechanism that I'm aware of that will allow you uh, relief mm -hmm. for misconduct by the Department of Family Services. Do they hire outside law firms? No, they, they have the biggest law firm in the state, and that would be the uh, Wyoming Attorney General's Office. So you're up against the Attorney General's Office. That's right. And what is their attitude when you file the suit? Um, they had a pretty seasoned lawyer. Uh, he was very set on getting to the facts of what happened. He wanted to know the truth. He wanted to know the truth, and it was, frankly, it was really refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, it is only one of two cases where I have ever seen a defendant apologize, and they publicly apologized. This is the Wyoming Department of Family Services issued a, uh, an apology. Was that a written apology? It was. Apology? It was published in, the, in our local newspaper. Okay. And what else were the nations able to get? Because they've suffered economically here. They, um, they were able to get a settlement of, uh, I think it was $150,000 uh, for the time that their business was, was shut down. Were they able to reopen their business? You know, I'm, I'm not sure if they did or they didn't. Um, Is there also a, 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 a price put on the fact that I'm sure there's a lot of people, and you see this when you bring a, when a case to, to trial, that a juror often thinks, people think that if you're not guilty, the government wouldn't have charged you, right? It's so a, maybe it'd be difficult for them to get their business going again. It's a sad state of affairs that accused people um, they had a pretty seasoned lawyer. Uh, he was very set on getting to the facts of what happened. He wanted to know the truth, and it was, frankly, it was really refreshing. Um, it is only one of two cases where I have ever seen a defendant apologize, and they publicly apologized. How long did it take to get this resolved? Well, the, the case went on for nearly a year. And so of course, six months, they don't plus, have any income. Plus a year. Plus a year. That's right. So it's, they're finding it difficult to survive because they're 70 years old. Well, and, and, and this is true in every case where you have someone that's injured. Yeah. Those people have to figure out a way to survive while the litigation's going. You know, you see some newspaper article that says, couple recovers two, three million dollars. Well, they may have lost their home, their car, their 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 virtually destitute, yeah. and, and um, how do you replace somebody's home? They may have lived in that home for 15 years and they're yeah. halfway through their mortgage and now they can't make that payment. These kinds of things are devastating to people and, and people, um, I don't know that they ever recover. I don't know that even if it's a, a complete and full recovery, if they ever are able to overcome what has been done to them by the wrongful conduct of the defendant. As a result of this case, in the state of Wyoming, have policies been put in effect where investigations have to be double-checked so this doesn't repeat itself again? Well, well the, the case went on for nearly a year. Within the, course, Department of Family within the Department of Family Services. No longer is the Gestapo saying that's it and no appeal. I remember we, uh, we subpoenaed a copy of the file from the Department of Family Services, and we yeah. found some inner office. I don't know if they called it email then, but but we found some inner office communications. And one of the supervisors says, "What are you doing? You're going to get us sued." And he's carrying on about how this was handled and how this was taken care of. This and, was a manager, and this was a manager. Yeah. And I remember taking his name was uh, Rick Breedlove, and we took his deposition, and we handed him those. Now the irony is, we didn't get those when the first time we got the record. See, those, those things were, were not included. How did you get him later on then? Well, we made him bring the file to his deposition and he just grabbed the file and brought it. Well, it just so happens that the person who went through the file to answer the discovery was yeah. one of the defendants yeah. that was named in the case. And so those things somehow weren't produced, but we did get them 
when he brought the whole file because he didn't know what he was bringing. I, yeah. or, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know what he knew. Yeah. By the way, whenever we do a show like this and we're talking about the, the Department, Department of Family, Family Services, Services, there are a lot of good people that do a lot of good I things remember in these agencies. We, uh, we what this case is all about and what this issue is all about is those bad apples that work some within a government agency I don't know if they call that it email then, heretofore but, but had had total immunity against the anything they did system. without any regard for You're the economic or the emotional toll that it took on the person how this was that they handled targeted. And how right? this was taken care of. And, and this is a manager. And I remember taking yeah. his name was uh, Rick Breedlove, and we took yeah. his deposition. And we handed him those. Now the irony is, we didn't get those when the first time we got the record. See, those those things were were not included. Well, we made him bring the file to his deposition, and he just grabbed the file and brought it. Well, it just so happens that the person who went through the file to answer the discovery was one of the defendants that was named in the case. And so those things somehow weren't produced, but we did get them mm -hmm. when he brought the whole file. Do you find and do you have a lot of cases, if you have a lot of cases, where the government has made false accusations against private individuals, civil rights kind of cases? We have a case right now, and um, uh, we are going to be filing suit in that case where uh, a young man was beaten by some officers. Uh, they came into his home in the middle of the night. Um, he was in, in bed, and, and uh, he was awoken, and, and um, when you read the police reports and then you interview the neighbors and you see the various things, mm -hmm. um, there are things in the police report that are just simply missing. Yeah. And, and um, any time people have uh, that kind of power, yeah. it is always, it is always um, a, a strong likelihood that at some point that power will be abused. Um, your philosophy when you take a case, and I think this is important for our audience to know, is that you are willing to do everything possible to take it to trial to seek justice, correct? Absolutely. When we take a case, um, you know, you see the, the, the new MMA fighting stuff on TV and they go in the octagon. Baby, when we go to a we go to trial, we're getting in the octagon, yeah. and and we're not going to hold any punches. We're going to do everything that's ethically and legally available to us right. to find out the truth. As a matter of record, the gal, the DFS worker, who unilaterally made a decision to revoke the nation's license, was anything done against her? Um, the answer to that is no. Uh, the settlement came from the state. Yeah. And there was never any recourse to her. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't unilateral. Her supervisor signed on the documents as well. So mm -hmm. she had discussed this with her supervisor. Yeah. And her supervisor was named a party to litigation. Right. Well, I'm glad you were able to handle their case. We need many more lawyers like yourself to handle cases like that because a little guy does need representation. And I want to thank you very much for being on the program. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.